Shakespeare. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Bunko Fugitive Detail. A man tells you he's been taken for a large sum of money. He thinks it was a swindle. Your job, run it down. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, September 12th. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of Bunko Fugitive Detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Didion. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from communications, and it was 2.17 p.m. when I got to room 38. Bunko Fugitive. Oh, hi, Joe. How are you? I get it. Uncle Fugitive, Friday. Yes, that's right. Mm hmm. Well, when'd you see him last? Well, how much was it? How much? Mm hmm. All right, sir. We'll be here. Well, right away, if I were you. All right, fine. Fellow's coming in to talk to us. Yeah? Says he gave a friend of his $40,000. Oh. Kind of broke up their friendship. What do you mean? The guy skipped out. Forty-two p.m. The man who had telephoned came into the office. He told us that his name was Jeff Craner. He said he had a real estate business on Wilshire Boulevard and that his home residence was on Rossmore near Olympic. He also said that on the previous Tuesday he had given forty thousand dollars to a man who called himself Philip Bonham. You know where this fellow Bonham lives, Mister Craner? I know where he used to live. Where's that? Our apartment out in Westwood. Real fancy, beams, ceilings, lots of glass, swimming pool, the whole works. He's not there anymore, huh? Well, manager of the building says he moved last Tuesday, the day I gave Phil the money. Who's they? Uh, Phil and his brother had the place together. Uh -huh. What's the brother's name? Steve. Does the manager have any idea where they went? Well, claims they didn't leave any forwarding address, just shoved off. How long have you known the Bonhams, Mr. Craner? Uh, six or eight weeks. Mm -hmm. How'd you happen to meet up? A through a friend, a mutual friend. What would you tell us about it? Well, well, it's not going to come out, is it? Uh, uh, newspapers, anything like that? Well, how do you mean? Well, you see, I'm I'm married. Yeah. Now, we haven't been getting along so well for the last year or so, but I'm still married. Mm -hmm. well, the way I met up with the Bonhams, you see, it was through a girl. Yeah. What was her name? Barbara, Barbara Whist. Uh, who's she? Oh, just a girl, that's all. Maybe she was in on it, too, I... I don't know. Anyway, she introduced me to him. About how long have you known her? Oh, uh, the three months, maybe, a few weeks before I met them. I see. We got acquainted at an auction. One of those houses out on Beverly Boulevard where they sell off furniture and things from movie stars' houses. Mm -hmm. Used to spend a lot of my free evenings at those auctions. Wasn't any point in staying home, not my wife feeling towards me, the way she does. I, I didn't buy much, just a piece every once in a while. It looked like a bargain. And that's where you met this woman, huh? Yes, yes. Where was she living, do you know? Uh, had a room at a hotel in Hollywood, the Count George. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Mr. Craner. What happened next? Well, we we got to be pretty good friends. and One night she offered to put me in touch with a couple of guys she knew. We said they were interested in buying some real estate and that I might as well handle the deal. Well, that's how I met up with the Bonhams. Yes, sir. We went out to their apartment there having a little party. A couple more girls were there. On a Friday night, I, I guess we all got kind of loaded. Next thing I knew, we were all flying down to Vegas for the weekend. Well, we sure had quite a time for ourselves. Stopped at one of the best hotels, Chateau Lafayette. Everybody making a big fuss like the Bonhams were VIPs. Yeah. After that, we had some deals together. Most of them worked out. Whenever they didn't, the Bonhams took care of me anyhow. What kind of deals? Mr. Craner? I guess maybe they weren't, well, strictly ethical, but there wasn't anything illegal about it. Mm -hmm. You've got to cut a couple of corners if you're going to get ahead in this world. Is that right? 
I get a little tired of this, Sergeant. Sir? You act like I'm at fault, like I'm the one who's in the wrong. Now, you remember it was me that got swindled in $40,000 worth. Mm. I'm not the criminal, you know. They are. Sure. You want to tell us about the 40000 Mr. Kramer? If you're all through with these accusations. Go ahead, Mr. Kramer. All right. It was last Tuesday. Phil Bonham called me at my office. Said he had to see me right away about a proposition, a really big one. Mm -hmm. We met for lunch. Bonham said they'd just had word from one of their contacts in Las Vegas. A couple of Eastern gamblers had tapped the casino of the Chateau Lafayette for a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Now, the Chateau needed some money, and they needed it fast. So the owners were willing to sell a 5% interest in the hotel for 100000 now, Phil said it was a cinch that we'd get our investment back inside of six months, and from then on, it was just gravy. Everybody knows how much those hotels in Las Vegas made. So you gave him the money? Yes, I drew it out of the bank that afternoon. It had to be in cash. Did you know the denominations of the bill? They were all hundreds. Mm -hmm. What happened then? I went back to the office, and the Bonhams took off for Las Vegas. At least that's what they were supposed to do. They said they'd call me from there. But when I still hadn't heard anything by Friday, I went over to their apartment and talked to the manager. He said they'd moved out Tuesday at 5 p.m. Why didn't you get in touch with us then? They didn't seem like crooks, not a bit. What were they like? Well, what? Would you describe them for us? Well, Phillips, the oldest, he's about oh, 45. Mm -hmm. a light hair, complexion. How big is he? Tall, about six foot man. Thin, sort of rangy. Mm -hmm. What about his brother? Oh, Steve's maybe three or four years younger. A little shorter. Not much, though. A little heavy. Well, what color is his hair? Reddish. Mm -hmm. The girl who introduced you to him, you said her name was Barbara Wist? Mm -hmm. Yes, that, that's right. How do you spell that? W-I-S-T. You want to describe her, too? Well, it's pretty hard to say how old she is. I'm just not very good at judging a woman's age. Well, approximately, then. Oh, 28, 29... 30, could could even be 35. Mm-hmm. Blonde, real light streak across the front. Very attractive. Good company, nice build. Well, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to get in touch with her since you saw the Bonhams last? Yes, I called a hotel. Well? She moved out last Thursday morning. Mm-hmm. Well, how are you supposed to know? What? Well, who to trust? They, they were so darn nice to me, the Bonhams and Barbara. There, there wasn't any way of figuring that what they were after. They, like you say, that they were just uh, kind of setting me up. Mm -hmm. But you had a tip off. Yes? Well, when? When you thought you were getting something for nothing. <laughs> p.m. We ran the names Philip and Steve Bonham and Barbara Whist through R and I. They had nothing on them. We went back to the office and showed the victim mug shots of known confidence men. He was unable to identify any of the photographs. 3:32 p.m. We showed him mugs of confidence women. No, not on that page, Sergeant. Uh huh. Um, Sergeant, hmm? my uh, my my wife won't find out about all this, will she? Not from us. We haven't been getting along for quite a while, but. Well, you know, she she just wouldn't understand. Mm -hmm. Funny, aren't they? How's that? Women, even if they won't have anything to do with you themselves, they just don't want another day moving in. Want to go on to the next page? Oh, yeah, sure. Say, say now. Yeah? That looks like her. Well, is it? No, I guess not. Something different there. Sure is a resemblance, though. Mm -hmm. Nobody on this page. Now, wait a minute. That was her. Where? Here, right here, the one I pointed out before. Oh, I see. That's Barbara, all right, right there. You said there was something different about this woman, didn't you? Well, it? there is, but now that I think about it, any gal's apt to do that. Do what? Dye her hair. <laughs> The victim was positive in his identification of the photograph. Frank and I pulled a woman's package. Her true name was Mabel Salton, WFA, 36 years old, 5 feet 4, weighed 117 pounds, blue eyes, brunette hair. Her record showed two convictions for grand theft and an arrest for suspicion of theft the previous June. 4.15 p.m., we talked to Johnny DeBetta, the officer who had made the June arrest. 
Yeah, that's right, Joe. Van and I pulled her in. We couldn't make it stick to her. Why not? Well, the victim gave us an eye dent, but we didn't have enough to hold her on. All she did was introduce the mark to a couple of con men. They did the taking. Mm-hmm. We couldn't prove that she was in on it. The sucker hadn't given her the money. Yeah. Wouldn't cop out either. Uh-huh. She's a looker, not a talker. I'd rather tackle a guy any time than a dame like that. Once she decides to keep her mouth shut, you can't get it open with a pair of pliers. Uh-huh. What about the guy she was working with? A couple of brothers. Don't remember the names they used offhand. It's in the file, so. Any leads to them? Uh, description, M.O. We put out a local and APB. We couldn't turn them up, though. They must have skipped town. I see. They had a tail for a while, see if she'd lead us to them. Yeah. Nowhere. That's where we ended up. They back in L.A.? They were last week. Make another pigeon? Yeah. And I hope you have better luck than we did. Yeah, we're going to need it. So we've moved on. It won't be very easy to catch up with. No? Uh-huh. They got a lot of traveling money. Oh, yeah? 40000 <laughs> Frank and I put out a local and an APB on the two male suspects. We also put out a bulletin on the female suspect, Mabel Salton. But we requested that in her case, no arrest be made. We asked to be contacted in the event that she was located. From Johnny the Better, we learned that the Salton woman had also met the previous victim at an auction. Auctioneers and owners of auction houses were told to notify us if they saw the suspect. We talked to the manager of the apartment where the male suspects had lived and to check the clerk at the Count George Hotel. They were unable to help us. We contacted Las Vegas and learned that the Chateau Lafayette was in excellent financial condition. We also contacted CII up at Sacramento to see if they could give us an identification of the male suspects. We received a negative response. No new leads developed. Five weeks passed. Wednesday, October 19th, 9.46 a.m. Uncle Fugitive, Friday. Yes, sir. That's right. When? I see. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Pinch your auction house out on 3rd Street. Yeah? Auctioneer says he sold a couple of lamps to an old customer last night. Who? Mabel Salton. and I drove out to the Tensure Auction Gallery on West 3rd. We showed the auctioneer a mugshot of Mabel Salton, and he said he was positive she was the woman he had seen the previous night. We went back to the office and had a conference with the skipper. You're sure picking her up won't do any good? Well, I didn't before, Captain. Yeah. Of course, this might not work either. We don't even know if her pals are back in town. Well, how do you plan to make the contact? Hang out at auctions, do a lot of bidding, let her think I'm loaded. I don't know. May it be better if Smith went under cover this time. He looks more like a mark to me. Well, now, wait a minute, skipper. Oh, you know what I mean. Well, I know. I'm afraid using Smith would give us a problem, Captain. Yeah. Take another look at her picture. Hmm. Not bad, is she? No, that's the trouble. Hmm? Smith's got a wife. Arrangements were made for me to assume the name of Joe Fawcett. I took a room at a hotel in Hollywood and established myself as a businessman recently arrived from Chicago. Auction houses were told that I would be bidding on various items, and if my bid was accepted, the item was to be re-auctioned at some future date, and any loss incurred would be made good. During the next week, I attended four auctions. The woman suspect, Mabel Salton, was present at two of them. Thursday, October 27th, 9.42 p.m., I attended the fifth auction. It was at the Pencher Galleries. I managed to get a seat next to the suspect. I have $45. I have $25. Who'll make it 30 Who'll make it 30 Well, I'll make it 30 Gentlemen, here I like this cost over $100 in any retail store. Twenty-five. Who'll give 30 30 Don't forget, ladies and gentlemen, this mirror belongs to one of America's most glamorous actresses, Miss Nora Westlake. You've all seen her dozens of times on the screen. Here's your chance to buy one of her personal possessions. And don't forget where this mirror was hung. In Nora's bedroom. <laughs> All right, now we'll make it 30. I have 25. Who'll give 30? 30 here. Thank you, sir. There's a gentleman who appreciates the fine things. I have 30. I have 30. You only want that 30. 35. 35. We'll give 40. 35. We'll give 40. How about it, sir? You want the little lady to take away from you? If you really want it, it doesn't matter that much to me. Well, that's very kind of you. I right, love that. 35. What? 35. Twice. Go to the lady for 35. Uh, and now, ladies and gentlemen. Our next item is a very unusual piece. It was designed to Thanks for letting my gift stand. That's all right. Forget it. Is there any way I can pay you back? Maybe you'd let me buy you a drink after the auction. No, that isn't necessary. I didn't really want that mirror anyway. I'd like to. 
Well, my sir, busy. No, not a bit. You've got a customer. Now, you see how hard it is for them to lift it? Shows you the quality of the model. All right, boys. Better set it down now again before you swing yourself. Haven't you done some of the other sales? A couple of them, yeah. Right. I thought you looked familiar. Come to think of it, I remember the things you bought. Is that right? Yeah, very good taste. Thank you. I just love these off. Of course, I always end up buying a lot of things I don't need. Well, that happens to me, too. And afterwards, you feel so darn foolish, but there's nothing you can do. By then, it's too late. Yeah, same here. Well, that's true. They isn't properly treated first. But this table will never do a thing, no matter what you want. Yes, want. we have something in common, don't we, Mr. Uh, Joe Fawcett. Joe Fawcett. I'm Mona Eastman. How do you do? Very nice to meet you, Mr. Fawcett. No, the pleasure's all mine. Eleven sixteen p.m. We left the auction and drove over to the suspect's apartment. It was on the second floor of a two-story building just off Olympic Boulevard. Fire's right over there, Joe. If you'll take charge when I get out of my coat. You bet. Dr. Bourbon. It doesn't matter. Whatever you're having. Hey. Is the ice all melted? No, there's a little left here. That's good. I'm really awfully glad you could drop by. So am I. Where's your drink? Okay. Well, cheers. Cheers. Strong enough for you? That's the way I like it. Why don't we sit down? Sure. Where's your home, Joe? Well, I really don't have one yet. Oh? I got a hotel room over in Hollywood. I've been staying there for the last few days. What about all these things you've been buying? The auction? Oh, they're all for my new place. It hasn't come out of escrow yet. I see. It's out in Bel Air. Wish they hurry up and let me move in. For all I know, I may be getting too much stuff. I don't know what you need to furnish your house. Well, isn't your wife? Uh, I mean... Oh, I'm not married, Mona. Not anymore. I see. We broke up about a year ago. Funny. What's that? That's when it happened to me. Just a year ago. Is that so? Maybe we have a little too much in common. Yeah. She hurt you, didn't she, Joe? Well... I can see it in your eyes. You have very sad eyes. You're soft and thoughtful. Oh, I don't know. I think you can tell a lot about a person from their eyes. You do, huh? That's the first thing I notice about somebody. What do you notice, Joe? Well, I guess I never thought too much about it, to tell you the truth. What did you notice first with me? Well? Well, I guess it was your voice. Oh? You know, when you were bidding, I think that's what I noticed first. I don't know whether that's a compliment or not. Well, you have a very pleasant voice, Mona. Very pleasant. George didn't think so. Who? My husband. Oh. He said I whined and nagged and made life miserable for him. Why'd you split up? This didn't work out. You think I'll ever try it again? Oh, I don't know. It's pretty hard to say. Yeah, I feel the same way. I guess lots of people make mistakes. Yeah, sure. You need a freshener? No, I have plenty here. I'll fix you up? Yes, please. You don't drink very much, do you? No, I just don't feel like it tonight. Oh. Is it the company? No, of course not. I'm sorry if I, well, sort of forced you into taking me home. Oh, don't be silly. I just felt it. Well, you didn't look very happy, and I thought maybe we both needed to be with someone else for a change. Sure. Yeah. Thanks. What line are you in, Joe? What's that? What's your business? Well, nothing right now. I guess you might say I'm unemployed. What? I had a company of my own back in Chicago. Textile manufacturing. I sold it when we split up. What are you going to do now? Oh, I'm sort of looking around. I got a little cash and let's get by on. Oh? If the right thing turns up, I guess I might go into it. Mm, I suppose it's hard to tell what to put your money into nowadays. Yeah, well, there's no hurry. You know, that reminds me. Hmm? If you really do want to get into something good... Yeah? I know a couple of businessmen. Oh, they're not close friends or anything like that, but they have some excellent contacts. Is that so? I'm sure they could put you into something that would give you a nice return on your investment. Well, this wouldn't do any harm to talk to them, would it? I'm afraid you can't right now. Why not? Well, they're out of town. It's too bad, isn't it? Yeah, sure is. Uh... The 
Salton woman told me she'd let me know as soon as her friends returned to Los Angeles. During the next ten days, I saw her on several occasions. As far as I could tell, the so-called Bonham brothers were still out of town. Tuesday, November 8th, 8.40 p.m. I was in my hotel room. Hello? Yes, Mona? Well, how about tonight? Sure, I'll pick you up. About 9.30? Fine. Bye. You want to get me Michigan 5211, please? That's right. Extension 2572. That's right. Extension 2572. Smith there? This is Joe. Yeah, I just heard from her. Better get hold of the bed and have him stand by. Tonight, says it just blew into town. <laughs> Over the phone, the Salton woman had told me her two business acquaintances had returned to Los Angeles. I was to meet them that night. Frank and Johnny DeBetta made arrangements to tail my car. 9.28 p.m. I picked up the female suspect. She told me her friends had rooms in the St. Clair Hotel over on Figueroa. We drove over there. It was 9.42 when we arrived. We went up to room 417. She introduced me to two men who matched the description of the male suspects we were looking for. They said their names were Tom and Fred Porst. Sure is nice to meet you, Mr. Fawcett. Uh, Mona's been telling us about you. It seems you've made quite a hit with her. Is that so? She told me about you fellas, too. Uh, now you've got to understand one thing. What's that? Anything we discuss in the business line, that is, well, it's got to be confidential. Well, sure. You see, my brother and I, uh, we don't make a practice of taking outside investments, right, Fred? Right. Uh, matter of fact, we don't even need any outside capital at the moment. We've sort of got a surplus. Oh, I see. Well, maybe some other time then, huh? Nice to have met you. Well, uh, what's your hurry for, sir? Well, you said that... I said we don't need any captain. Yeah. Well, we might make an exception in your case, though. Oh? On account of Mona. Well, I want you to put yourselves out. Something else will turn up. Like now, that. wait a minute. <laughs> I was just thinking. What's that? Well, it never hurts to spread a good thing around. You got any plans for this Saturday? Well, I don't know. What do you have in mind? Well, I thought we might fly down to Vegas. Get us a couple of girls. You can bring along Mona. Why Vegas? Oh, we got a friend down there. He made a killing at the crap tables a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Stuck it in thousand dollar bills. Oh. Now he sort of forgot to mention it on his income tax, and now he could use the loot, but he's afraid to cash in the bills himself. Yeah, I see. He uh, might be willing to sell them to us at a discount. Are you interested? No, not very. Why not? An old con game like that. What? Well, this is the best you can do. The thousand dollar bill routine's got whiskers on it. I should have known. What are you talking about? How would you know? Listen, Fawcett, what are you doing here anyway? Why'd you want to meet us? I was kind of curious about how you boys work. I heard a lot about you. Huh? Thought maybe I could pick up a new angle or two. Looks like I was wrong. <laughs> well, what's the joke? <laughs> oh, don't you see? He was just checking up on our pitch. Yeah? Well, he's a con man, too. <laughs> oh, you really pulled one this time, Mona, picking a pro for a mark. <laughs> How was I supposed to know? Well, just one look. You should have been able to tell platers of those on your face. <laughs> it is, huh? Sure. Don't take it to heart, buddy. You might fool the suckers, but I'm in the same racket. <laughs> well, I should have guessed it when you walked in the door. It's written all over you. Yeah. Uh, where have you been pitching lately? City Hall. Huh? I'm a police officer. You're under arrest. <laughs> The story you've just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 2nd, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the county of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. <laughs> Mabel Harris Salton was tried and convicted of grand theft one count and received sentence as prescribed by law. Thomas Herbert Porst and Fred James Porst, alias Philip and Steve Bonham, were tried and convicted of grand theft two counts and received sentence as prescribed by law. Grand theft is punishable by imprisonment in the county jail for not more than one year or in the state prison for not less than one nor more than ten years.